This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. We begin in Cape Elizabeth, Maine, on the morning of November 27th, 1989, at the home of 16-year-old Sarah Michael. Um, I remember Katie coming over to my house. It was the day after Thanksgiving, and we were going to go Christmas shopping. Disgusting. They're really good. My mother had baked cookies the day before, and we decided to have one because she loves chocolate chips. What are you going to get wrong? She took two bites out of her cookie and immediately asked me, what are in these cookies? And I said, just normal type things. The two girls had planned to spend the afternoon shopping with friends at a mall in South Portland, six miles away. Hey. I was in a pretty good mood. I think we all were. <laughs> Lori pulled out and just started driving to Portland. Did you have a good Thanksgiving bar? Yeah, I did. Went to Rhode did? Island. Mm -hmm. Just for the day, and I think. Turkey dinner, aunt's house. <coughs> Aunties. Did you drive in your car or did you go with your parents? No, we all just took a car. Oh, one car? Katie had asked to go to the drugstore to get some asthma medicine, and she went in and bought some allergy pills. I have asthma too, so I noticed her wheezing and she definitely wasn't as talkative or chatty as she usually is. Katie's friend Lori was driving that day. Katie rolled on the window, probably about halfway there, and just we just said she wanted some air and then she started putting her hand up towards her mouth. I just figured that she just maybe had the flu or something, nothing major. And right before we were about to go off the ramp, she started to throw up. That's when we decided to go left to home rather than right, which is the mall. I asked her, you know, are you okay? And she said, yes, but I, I am wheezing. And I think it was something in the cookie. We were all pretty quiet. We were just kind of like trying to, I guess, reassure her that she would be okay. She was just sitting up real straight and she was having a really hard time breathing and she was kind of holding her throat a little bit and said, I'm not gonna make it, take me to the police station. And we became panicked when she said that. We knew that the South Point Police Station was in a general area, but we didn't know which street to get to it. She said that she felt like her throat was closing up, she couldn't breathe. I was very worried. I was very scared. Something was different. This wasn't a normal asthma attack. Katie, can I see your hand? I looked at Katie's nails and they were blue. I was looking in the mirror, they were giving me signs that they were scared, but we were trying to, you know, keep it pretty calm between us because we didn't want Katie to get scared. I'd never been to that police station. I knew it was one of two roads, and I just happened to pick the wrong one. We turned down this long street, and when we got to the end, we were facing a one-way street going the opposite direction, and the police station really was only about two to three hundred yards away from us. I'm going up it, guys. 
But I said, I'm going up it. And Katie said, no, turn around, go up the other way. I knew she didn't have much more than a few minutes, so I just wheeled the car right around and just floored it. That was probably the scariest part, because right then she was just, I mean, couldn't breathe, couldn't do anything. And I knew that I just had to get that car going as fast as I could. And we were all thinking that she was just going to pass out on us and die. When we continue. I started crying because she was my best friend. And she's so young. She's got so much more to do, so much more to see. And she hasn't done enough and hasn't lived enough. Stay strong, Kate. When 16-year-old Katie Martin seemed to be suffering a severe asthma attack, her friends rushed to get her to the nearest police station before she could no longer breathe at all. We were all kind of planning out what we were going to do when we got to the police station. And I decided that I'd be the one to call Mrs. Martin, and Sarah would be the one to go run in and get the police. Allison and I were basically out of the car before it had stopped. Sarah quickly explained the problem to the first officer she met. Right out there, in the parking lot. Uh, yes. yes. Okay, go ahead. I'll call you. She was just frozen okay, so and just kept saying, help me, Lori, help me. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. She just looked up. She just looked so scared and so helpless. What happened to her? Officer Buddy Pelletier was first on the scene. What's your name? Katie. Katie, listen to me. People that have respiratory problems, the more they gasp for air, the less oxygen they get. Her respirations were getting shallower and shallower, and at some point in time, she actually stopped breathing. She just looked up into my face and then the policeman's face, and I couldn't help her. And I couldn't do anything for her, and I couldn't stop what was happening. Detective Peter McVeigh also ran to help. Just as he got around the corner, her body just gave we away. Lost her. A South Portland ambulance was dispatched from less than two blocks away. I started crying because she was my best friend, and she's so young. She's got so much more to do, so much more to see, and she hasn't done enough and hasn't lived enough. EMT Kevin Giemund arrived within minutes. I knew right then when we were pulling in that she wasn't breathing. She just looked like a sack of potatoes. Okay. He took the respirator out of the kit. I immediately put it on her face and started forcing air into her lungs. She wasn't getting the air that way. You can see the air coming on the sides. Her throat was just swollen up and closed up, apparently. You can tell if they're dying or not, if they're chalky, if they're... You can tell. This girl was on her way out. I could have wasted time, tried to start an IV, tried to do some other things, but that wouldn't have saved her. She needed air. She needed oxygen. Without oxygen, Katie could suffer permanent brain damage within six minutes. I took an oral airway. They're about three inches long. Usually you can pop an oral airway in and ventilate fairly decently, but it just wouldn't work. She had a lock jar. Her teeth were locked together. So I grabbed a nasal airway. It's a skill you learn in basic EMT class, but you learn it one evening for 10 minutes, and that's it. You never really think you're going to use it. Try that. One sound. It worked real quick. Real quick. All right, give me a driver. Let's get out of here. At that time, I still wasn't positive she was going to live. We just all said we got to think positive. You know, they're professionals. They can bring her back. Katie was admitted to the main medical center under the care of Dr. Rick Baker. She wasn't moving any extremities. It was really very unresponsive on arrival. We were very concerned that she was going to continue to deteriorate to a full arrest. As soon as Katie's mother, Sally, got Allison's call from the police station, she headed to the hospital. I thought the girls had just maybe overreacted. Katie has had allergies and asthma really ever since she was a tiny baby. 
I remember walking through the door and I said to her, where's Katie? And the nurse looked at me and she said, um, Katie is in the trauma unit and we're working on her and we're doing the best we can. At that point, I felt like somebody taking a sledgehammer and knocked me right in the stomach. Our concern was to give her an injection of adrenaline just the moment she hit the place. 0.5 of epi. It stops the swelling that's going on and really puts a halt to the allergic response. Okay, okay, Katie. Sorry, Katie. Okay, Katie. Okay. She took an additional two injections of adrenaline in order to help stabilize her. And on top of that, required some Benadryl, which is an antihistamine, to help pull her out of this. It probably took about 20 minutes for her to wake up and sit up and talk to us. I went over to her side and I took a hold of her hand, which was ice Hi, cold. Katie. And she. Hi, darling. She looked at me. No, Katie. It's mom. The only thing I could think of was that she was an angel. Because I, I had thought I was dead. You're doing fine. In the emergency room. You're doing I fine. said in this mother-teacher tone. I said, Katie, it's your mother. You're fine. You're going to be all right now. <laughs> right, we get to go now. Katie survived without any permanent injuries. Her parents later questioned her friends to discover what had caused the near-fatal allergic reaction. Mr. Martin said, did she eat the nuts? And that's when I said, yeah, there were nuts in the cookies. There were walnuts in the cookies. And he said, that's what it was. It never occurred to me that an allergy could be that bad. I think all of us had just kind of learned to appreciate life a little more. It made us stronger, I guess, as friends. Katie has since been tested for other allergies. She now wears a medic alert tag that lists them and a number to call in an emergency. Although more than a year has passed, her father, Al, can't forget. It's only later that it really hits you, I think. I'm really a lucky guy. I mean, I came so close to losing a daughter, and uh, just by a combination of her own good sense and three wonderful young friends that were mature enough to know what to do, and then finally the rescue people that did such a professional, talented job, they are the difference between Katie being here and her not being here. When you've been that near death, you know, I think it really makes you aware of how thin the line is. You know, you only live once, or most people do. And you gotta live life to what it is. If you wanna do something, you do it. And you don't wait for it to happen to you. You go out and do it. Next. I need the police, armed robbery in progress. We get so many routine type of calls that when something in progress or life-threatening happens, it sometimes catches you off guard. He's coming up to me with a mask on his face. On the evening of April 18, 1991, at a fast food restaurant in Bakersfield, California, Patty Fainer and two fellow employees were just getting ready to close up for the night. It was about 10 o'clock at night, and I was doing the dishes. Sandy was cleaning the grill, and Dave was going to sweep in the dining room. There were no customers at all and it had been pretty slow for like about 30 minutes.
At 9.55 p.m., a call came in to Bakersfield Police Dispatcher Andrea Gavin. 911. I need the police. Armed robbery in progress. Where at? Wiener Schnitz on. But we get so many routine type of calls that when something in progress or life threatening happens, it sometimes catches you off guard. Is, does the guy have a gun? Yeah, I just I was out front sweeping. He didn't see me. He just took somebody to the back with a gun to their head. Okay, hold on. I want you to calm down and think of a description while I get this call going. I was in fear for the employee that he said the suspect had a gun to her head. But at that particular moment, my main concern was him and getting the officers out there. Attention, city units, 211 in progress. RP is observing 1023 for further, 3 Baker 12, 1 April 14, 3 April 15, copy. He's wearing uh, a uh, baseball cap and I believe a sweatshirt. Wearing a baseball cap, what color shirt? Uh, I just caught a glimpse of him. I, I believe it was a, uh, a sweatshirt, I'm not real sure. What color? Uh, gray, I believe. He was holding an employee with a gun? Yes, he had the gun to the back of her head and he took her into the back room immediately. I don't think he saw me. And he started walking us back towards the safe. When we got about to the drive through window, he told Sandy that she had two tries to open the safe. I think he might have come in through our drive through window because the back door is locked. There is a male watching me from the parking lot. Okay, talk, where are you calling me from? From a payphone in the parking lot. This is the second time we've been hit. Last time he had an accomplice waiting in the same position. He's watching me right now. He's coming up to me with a mask on his face. I got real excited. My adrenaline got going, and I got very scared for that man. That guy's coming up to you with a mask on his face? Yes, and he's running at me, and he has a okay. gun in his hand. Okay, he's running at you, and he has a gun in his hand? Sir, he just get off the phone. Okay, hold when the phone went dead. I thought he'd been shot. Usually we're on the phone with people till the officers arrive. This time I had no idea if he was going to be alive when the officers got there. I didn't think he would. 37 Avenue units responding. RP's no longer landline. He advised the suspect was running at him with the firearm, advised him that if he didn't get off the phone, he'd shoot. No further. Among the officers who responded was patrolman Jack Smith. A lot of things go through your mind going to calls like this. If I come in too quick and he sees me inside, then I'm going to have a hostage situation. I'm going to have to deal with that. If they're fleeing, what's going to happen to me then? Am I going to let these two armed gunmen get away from me? Right about this time, a customer came through the drive-thru. I didn't know whether to take the order or not, so I just went ahead and took my chances. Sandy couldn't open the safe. Too nervous. I've got the combination. I'll give it to you. I can't keep it open. He told her, you have one more try. After three or four tries, she finally opened it. I thought about signaling to the customers, but what could they do? They were outside and I was inside. I'd be dead before they had a chance to get in. Get over here and get the register money. Ketchup and salt for my french fries, please. You have a nice night. Thank you. Lyle Martin was the first officer on the scene. Just as I reach the back of the business, two subjects come running out. That's a big round northbound on the east side of Albertson. He was scared, and he was just a look of disbelief, like, no way, the police are here. Simultaneously, the Kern County Sheriff's helicopter arrived.
Martin shot him. But again, shot person off. I thought either Officer Martin had shot at one of the suspects. Or the suspects had shot at me because I was coming up in the car. Still 15 of the other unit. Did you follow the shot? Baker 12 negative. Still 51 shot has been fired. At that time, I know the suspects have fired a shot here. So I put out over the radio, be very careful. These guys have guns, and they're open fire on us already. Baker 12, Air 1, they're going to be just past this pink house where my light's going to be going. As the helicopter searched over, I could see there was a 9mm handgun laying on top of the brick wall that the suspect had just climbed. I could also see there was an expended casing on the ground, so I knew that they just, they just capped off the round. Everyone had a visual on this area. They couldn't have gotten out of the area. They're within three or four yards right in there. This guy looked just like something you see out of the movies. He still had the bandana on his face, just like a train robber. And he was in a pile of money. Uh, 3. I told him that next time you run from police, take your finger off the trigger when you climb on those brick walls, then you won't shoot yourself. And he groaned or something, but he wasn't very happy. Bakersfield police units searched the area for the second suspect, including Officer Renee Chow. 2014 with a subject in Madrid and Limerick. I saw him wearing a black sports type jacket, fitting description. Put your hands up. At that point, I ordered him to place his hands up and uh, took him into custody. King five, two. King five. Do you have a second subject in custody? He's got one in custody here. Copy. Stand by with him. We'll bring a witness pass. Three of them were brought to his location where they viewed him and identified him as one of the suspects. This particular call lasted maximum five minutes. And in five minutes, we had 25 cops on the scene. Our perimeter set up, suspects in custody. Any other cops showed up, it was valet parking. The two suspects were subsequently convicted of robbery and sentenced to prison. All three employees of the fast food restaurant survived the incident unharmed. For shift manager Sandy Logan, it wasn't easy coming to grips with what happened. After the whole night was over, I went home, talked to my husband, and we cried. I was scared out of my mind. I really thought I wasn't going to get through that evening. I think police officers did a fantastic job. As far as I'm concerned, they got there in the nick of time, just in time to catch them. I think Dave's the hero. Most people would have just ran. I would have probably ran somewhere and called the cops from somewhere else, you know. Dave Urex doesn't regret the choice he made that night. I guess you don't know what you're going to do in a situation until it happens, but here he is taking them to the back, and you've only got like a second or two to decide what you're going to do. So I just instantly made a choice. Yeah. Go to the phone, call the police get this thing stopped before anything happened. Thank you. I kind of surprised myself the way I reacted. It let me know that I wouldn't just fold up on the floor and panic, that I would at least do something. To our together. Next. Scott was one of the bigger goofballs because he's always joking around, so nobody knew he was hurt. On a hot day in May of 1991 in the suburbs of Greenville, South Carolina, some friends from the local high school band gathered at a backyard pool to try to cool off. 
18-year-old Scott Burdett and his girlfriend Kelly Hart had been going together for almost a year. Several guys were like, having a contest, trying to show off just cannonballs and whatever. They could think that they were making them up. Scott was one of the bigger goofballs. We were all on the side watching them, and then Scott dove off. I didn't think anything was wrong with him at first because he's always joking around, so nobody knew he was hurt. <coughs> and I go over there and I grab him by the waist, and he said his neck is hurt. And then he said, Kelly, I couldn't move, and I was scared, just real scared. Krista, he hurt his neck. Kelly called for Scott's sister, Krista. I went over there to him. She was holding him up, and I kind of like, you know, just put my hands on his back, and I asked him, I said, Scott, are you really hurt? Because he plays around so much. But he was like, yeah, man, I'm really hurt. He was serious. Call for help. Get him out of the pool. No, leave him alone. And somebody told me to get him out of the swimming pool. I said, no. I had been in a class, and two EMS workers had told us to um, not move the victim in case of head and spinal cord injuries. It could cause paralysis. Mom, Mom, Scott hit his head on the bottom of the pole. He's hurt pretty bad. A call to 911 was made almost immediately. 911 emergency. Greenville County Dispatcher Carolyn Northway took the call. All right, it's the person who's injured himself. Is he still in the pool? Right away, she said it is a diving accident, which led me to believe possibly paralysis. The uppermost in my mind was not to get him out of the pool until our trained personnel arrived, where we could secure his neck and get him out without further damaging him. Rescue units from the Berea Fire Department and Greenville County EMS were dispatched to the scene. I just started, and I just started realizing that he was really hurt. And I was trying not, trying not to cry or anything. And we kept shaking. We were trying to, trying to be still. But we kept shaking. I was crying. I was shaking, and I was scared that I was going to move him. I, I had to be calm because if I had moved, I could have hurt him very badly. One of Scott's friends called his mother, Erlette Burdett. I'm a nurse, and I know the things that happens usually when kids or people jump into a pool and hurt their neck. And so the first thing I did was say a prayer. And then just got in the car and went over there. Off-duty paramedic Tom Kickler heard the report of the accident on the scanner and rushed over to see if he could help. Okay, is he conscious? Mm -hmm. I took my shoes and my socks off, and I eased myself into the water to try to reduce any effect of rippleness because any type of movement may aggravate his injury. Okay, so how you doing, bud? Are you having any trouble breathing at all or anything like that? No. He said, well, he wasn't able to move any of his extremities. And at that point, he had some numbness in his arms and legs. When the medic unit arrived, EMS supervisor Bill Markley took charge. What do you got, Tom? Yeah, we got a possible spinal injury. Uh, jumped in the pool, struck his head. No loss of consciousness. Uh, he's got some tenderness in the C-spine. The head mobilization was taken over by, by Tom, and then the cervical collar was applied to Scott at that time. Scott, it's going to be a little uncomfortable, but it's going to keep your neck from moving. Uh, once we got everybody assembled, we had sufficient personnel in the pool to handle the situation. We rotated Scott onto his back, being very careful to keep his head in alignment with his body. And then we floated a backboard under him and secured him in a reeve sleeve, which completely mobilized the body from, from head to toe. Scott's mother arrived just as the paramedics were ready to remove him from the pool. I just went over to him and told him that I was there. As I looked at him, I could see fear in his eyes, but he was very quiet. 
He didn't try to speak or anything. One, two, three. It was hurting to see my brother being taken away. It was like I kept trying not to cry before, but then we got on the deck. I don't know, it just. I guess it just all started coming out. We had um, a friend whose brother-in-law had had a motorbike accident, and he was paralyzed from it. Several months ago, Scott and I were talking, and he asked me, he says, Mom, if anything like that ever happens to me, he says, I want you to pull the plug, and that, that kind of means, you know, I don't want to live that way. I was thinking that he wasn't going to get to do the stuff that he wanted to do, go to college, get to do what he planned on doing. And um, I wasn't sure what was going to happen between us. Scott was transported to Greenville Memorial Hospital, where he was examined by neurosurgeon O.M. Ballinger. The x-ray showed that he had a broken neck. If he were allowed to bend his head forward about another quarter of an inch at the scene, he probably would have been permanently paralyzed. Kelly deserves a lot of credit. She resisted the uh, attempts and the pleas of other teenagers at the scene to remove him from the pool. And had Kelly done so, the outcome would have been tragically different, I'm sure. Six months after undergoing surgery to repair his broken neck, Scott Burdett has made an amazing recovery. I really love Kelly a lot, and I really do appreciate she saving my life. And, I mean, there's not really words that you can say for stuff like that. He's always treating me nice but I think he seemed sweeter, I guess you'd say, to me. I was gonna stay with him if, even if he was paralyzed, and I think that's what was going through his mind, too. Um, that he was scared that he was gonna lose me also, but I was gonna stick through him no matter what happened. I feel closer to Kelly than anybody he's ever dated, just because I know that she cares about him, and. I trust her more than I do anybody else. Kelly is grateful that she had a chance to learn first aid techniques. I think the lesson is that, you know, pay attention to anything, because I had no idea when I was sitting there Listening to them, I had no idea that I was going to be using the procedures that I had learned. I think that some teenagers at some time or another do learn the lesson of their own mortality. It made me realize that life can be taken away from you in a snap. I think it's made me grow up a little bit more. I think it made, really, the whole group grow up a little bit more. Next. I realized that the call was a little bit more severe than what I thought it was because something was really panicking. Not every call that comes into a 911 center is a matter of life and death, but dispatchers must be prepared to handle any type of emergency. At 8.32 a.m. on the morning of May 29, 1991, in Douglasville, Georgia, dispatcher Tim Bridges picked up a little girl's call for help. Emerging 911. 
Your baby is asleep and won't wake up. No, my daddy. Your daddy. I have to go to school. What's your At first, I didn't think there really was a problem, except for her father just wouldn't get up and take her to school. You know what your address is, sweetie? Yeah. Um, let me think. Um, Are you on Parkway? Yeah, I'm Parkway. Okay, he won't wake up. No. Can you tell if he's breathing all right? What's your name? My concern right then was to get somebody out there just to see what the problem was, if there was a problem. You go transfer to the sheriff's office, okay? Hold on just a second. <laughs> uh, Holly? Holly? What? You all right? You're scared? You're scared? I'm scared of ambulances. Okay, you're afraid of ambulances? Okay. Yes, they are. Right then when she said ambulance, especially when Holly started crying, then I realized that the call was a little bit more severe than what I thought it was because something was really panicking her. I shake him and try to um, wake him up and I couldn't wake him up. I, I was afraid that um, something was wrong with him and he was sick. There's emergency Douglas County. Yeah. Who am I speaking with over the sheriff's office? Uh -huh. Deputy Whitaker. Yeah, this is Sam um, Holly over here. She says that her father keeps going, <laughs> waking up and going back to sleep. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get an ambulance yeah. in route, find out what's going on. <laughs> She was scared. Um, she was crying. She was upset. How old are you? I know that you turn um, on the right, but I don't know what the song he is breathing. Nobody? He's what? He is breathing. He is breathing. He's dead. Paramedic Charles Brookshire kept in contact with the dispatchers. They said that the person was going in and out of consciousness. You start to assess that in your mind. We weren't sure what could have been the problem. Could have been maybe even uh, blood pressure that's created a stroke or something along those lines. Nobody's there with you but your father, right? Yeah. Okay. Hang on for me, okay, Holly? Okay. I'm going to get somebody to come down there and look at him for you, okay? Okay. Well, is it going to be a lot of people? Just going to be one deputy at first, okay? My name is Kathy. Kathy? Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Well, it'll be okay. Dispatcher Kathy Ombi had been monitoring the call. My concern was that I needed to calm Holly down because she was scared. And with me telling her, you know, that my name was Kathy and that I was there to help her, then she calmed down a little bit. What am I going to do? Well, just, Kathy, just, uh -huh. go ahead and talk to him and we'll give the call to the deputy analysis here, okay? Okay, great. Okay, Holly. Mm -hmm. Okay, what we're going to do is the sheriff's department is going to send an officer out, but we're also going to send an ambulance out in case he's sick, okay? Um, please, you'll be able to take me to school because I have to go to school. Okay, well, we'll just have to wait and see what they say, okay? I said I have to go to school. I was scared that my teacher would get mad. Uh-huh. He's going to straight and turn on the right. It has a Moser truck, a white Moser truck. A white what? Moser truck. Moser truck. Uh-huh. Oh, I know where you live at. Where? I go down, uh, do you have a uh, skylight in your house? I know where you live at. I live in that neighborhood myself. Uh, although we knew the address, it still doesn't hurt to have all the directions that you can have for an officer. I 
kept trying to, to, to compliment her f for doing such a, a good thing, for, especially for a five-year-old to pick up a phone and call 911. Hi, Ollie. Huh? I'm still here. Yeah, I have a 911 picture on my telephone. Yeah, well, you did real good this time. How old are you, Holly? Uh -huh. Five. I'm sorry, sweetie. I wish I could come, but I can't come. I've got to stay. I well, I've got to stay here and answer the phone for somebody, for somebody else. I see another little girl might need me, just like you did. When she told me that she had wanted me to come out, that got to me. Um, and it, you know, it still bothers me every time I hear the call, because I knew that she was scared. I told her I was scared of ambulances. I'm scared of the siren. What I was going to do was to have them turn their sirens off before they got close to her house, so it wouldn't frighten her even more. I'm glad you Yeah. I'm glad you Yeah, I'm proud of you. You did real good this time. But they'll be there, should be there in just a minute. How are they? When she told us that the fire trucks were there, a sigh of relief came to me. Well, Holly, you go out there and let them know that, that you're... Can you go ask them where it's time to get That's fine, Holly. Just go on out there and talk to them, okay? I don't know what day it is. Okay, one of them's name is James Jones. What? Ask, uh, tell them you want to speak to James. I wanted to give her someone that she could relate to on a personal basis. Bye, Holly. I knew that there was somebody there that could help her now. I asked everybody if there were James. No, James with a fire truck. He'll be here in just a second. Where's your dad? She wanted to know what's I James, and uh, it sort of startled me. How'd this little girl get my name, you know, first of all? And, I said, sure, I, I'm James, and uh, I decided to take her in the house because she didn't need to see her dad in, in that kind of shape. You okay? Did you wake up? Hey, hey, wake up. Talk to me now. He was unconscious, responsive only to painful stimuli. Yeah. He reacted to us, he sat up and then began to speak to us, but he was thoroughly confused. He had no idea what day it was or where he was at. And then shortly after, he went to unconsciousness again. You have any kind of uh... We had to get some information from Holly, because Holly was our only link to what was wrong with her dad. Had her dad been sick? I asked Holly had her dad been sick, and she said Did no. Did any kind of medication? They asked me um, if he took some kind of medicine. Britt, she's going to come in there. I showed him where the medicine was in the refrigerator. In the refrigerator? These are beds? Thank you. Once we found the insulin, it confirmed to me that he was an insulin-dependent diabetic and that he was hypoglycemic, headed for severe insulin shock. Holly saved her dad's life, there's no question. If Holly had not called, he probably would have gone to zero and that could end up in death. Dan Exum was treated at Douglas General Hospital and released later that same morning. You going to school? What are you going to do? You going to roller skate today? Yes. When's the next time you're going? My brother Denny's a, a single parent. Has been raising Holly on his own for a couple of years now. You need to trim your bangs. Uh, gets Holly up in the morning, gets ready for school, works a full-time job, has all the duties of mom and dad. Dan is grateful that his daughter Holly knew what to do in an emergency. I was really surprised. I was, I was proud of her. Um, because it's just her and I, and she's the only one that was here to help me. If it hadn't been for her, I don't know what would have happened or where I'd be. Parents should teach their kids to use 911 when it's an emergency and not to play on the phone and make the prank calls. Easy. Easy. All right. That's great. I called 911 all by myself. I felt like that. They were going to um, take care of my dad. What she did was, uh, actually, she saved my life. She's a great little girl. I love her.